Hey again, YouTube. It's been a while. I've been busy traveling and working and whatever else, but uh, I'm back and it's time to do something ridiculous. We're going to build a ridiculous cartridge that will hopefully expand the GPIO capabilities of the C64 onto a cartridge by adding a 6522 to it and doing some addressing with that little guy there. We'll get into him in a minute. So, uh, this video is brought to you by PCB Way wonderful people that make boards and all other kinds of good stuff for the retro community, among others. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll dig into that in a second uh, as far as what you can get and where you can get it. But I just wanted to shout out to these guys, man. They, they sent me a 10-pack of these boards so I can make 10 ridiculous cartridges, and we'll, uh, we'll see what kind of random junk we can plug into the backs of our machines. So, uh, no, that's, that's the intro. We'll... Uh, I guess I'll have to get on the computer, do a little screen cappy kind of thing, and I'll uh, tell you a little more about the boards, where to get them, and what we're going to do. All right, here's my sales pitch on PCB Way. This is not scripted. They didn't really put me up to this. They just gave me a couple of boards for free, you know. Uh, more than a couple. They, they've been very generous and sent me a lot of really cool stuff. So at any rate, you know, here's their website. It's really easy to get on here, make an account. If you go to Shared Projects and search for, I mean, you can just type Commodore in here, and you're going to see a ridiculous amount of neat stuff. You know, here's a 1581 board. Um, keyboard, uh, what is this, uh, 64 to 128 adapter. I might need one of those. Yeah, we're going to save that for later. Um, Amiga parts, whatever else. But uh, here, let's do a Commodore cart. And, yeah, you'll find all kinds of different carts and add-ons and whatever. Here's a cartridge. And it's as easy as add to cart and then pick a few colors. Pick, you know, whatever kind of finish you want it in. But it's five bucks. Um, shipping is a little weird for me. This isn't quite right. But if you, uh, well, you can get it shipped cheap. Here's like a $5 shipping option. So don't let this $20 shipping throw you off. You can, there's cheaper ways to do it. Um, this isn't even set up right for me because I'm not even in the United States right now. So anyway, um, you know, you can pick whatever color you want the board in, how you want it finished. If you just want cheapy prototypey kind of stuff, or if you want to go to gold plated and whatever else. So it's a matter of click item, save to cart and click go. And the thing shows up at your house. So, yeah, I mean, if you want a board that there's already designed for out there, it's as simple as that. Um, you can upload Gerber files from GitHub projects, and it's pretty much as simple as that. There's one or two hoops you jump through when you do the upload, and that's it. Super easy. So get out there, go buy some circuit boards, and go make something neat. So, anyway, moving on, let's, uh, let's get into what we're going to build. All right, first things first, if we're gonna put weird shit on a cartridge, we have to be able to address it. So this is gonna be our address decoder. Um, there is a prerequisite to all of this, and that is something like that. This is, uh, if you've seen previous videos, the address decoder board that further breaks out all the address space on the C64 that is largely unused and is just mirrors of other devices in the system and stuff like that, like the Vic and the SID really. So what this board does is breaks out the uh, those mirrored ranges so you can hook other stuff up to it. Uh, there's, uh, I won't go into it too much now, there's other videos on this. I'll uh, pop them in the links or look at the channel or whatever, but this is the uh, DeBone Super Duper Decoder Board or whatever you want to call it. So um, we're gonna need one of these address lines. We're gonna use 600. And I almost have a reason for that, but um, that'll be that pin. So that's the only downside to this is we're gonna to have to have a wire hanging out of the back of the computer to help with the addressing. Um, and that'll come from here and dangle out the back. So anyway, this is what the decoder will look like. It's uh, just another 139, you know, just like the two that are on here, the one that's originally in your machine. And we take the 600 line out of this board, come into pin 15 with it, and then we bring address line six and seven from the cart in on pins 14 and 13, and that will give us four new address ranges to play with. D600 just gets passed through. 
if uh, A6 and 7 are low. Uh, when A6 comes high, you'll get D640. When A7 comes high, you'll get D680. And then when they both come high, you'll get an output low for D6C0. And that is where we're going to drop our new CIA. Um, and yes, I said CIA. I've decided against using 6522 uh, for a number of reasons. One, it's got that old shift register bug. That might bite me in the ass later. To uh, chip select is a little different on that, and it's easy enough to work around, but I'm not going to bother. And, you know, three is that the 6526 is, uh, the config registers are slightly different from the 22. Um, and just to keep things consistent with the rest of the machine, that'll be good. And fourth and most importantly is that I don't have very many 6522s. So uh, I've only got one or two left, and if I blow them up, I won't have spares for 1541s or VIC-20s or any of that other stuff. So um, but I guess number five is that uh, I don't want to blow up uh, an original Moss 6522. You know, if it was like a 65C22 or something else, maybe I'd be more prone to blowing it up. Um, but I'd rather blow up parts that are in current production. Um, and I have some spare JCIAs, and it would suck to blow this up. I'm going to try real hard not to, but, you know, I, they're readily available. I could buy another one if I exploded the thing. Can't buy another Moss 6522 without going through AliExpress or eBay, and God only knows what it is you're really going to get. So, anyway, this is what our addressing is going to look like. So, you know, 5 volt and ground in, D600 in from our, our wander lead that's going to hang out the back. 6 and 7 are available on the cart. Here's our outputs, and that will get wired to the CIA chip. So, uh, next let's, uh, here it is, let's do board layout. So this is kind of what I've come up with. I think this will work fairly well. Um, having the socket oriented this way, this is, you know, the, the notch, right? So pin one's going to be over here, and that is ground. These are all the out, or, uh, IO pins, you know, uh, port A and port B. Uh, so they can face that way, so we can bolt things over there if we want to. All the signals on this side are going to be coming from the machine, and we'll be able to grab them off these pins here. So uh, all of these, well, I guess they're pads, not quite pins yet, but all these pads here are mirrored in this area here. Um, they're just, you know, run right through. If you can see, there's a little white outline around there. So all the signals are available on these pads, on these through holes, and then these through holes. So... Um, A0, 1, 2, and 3 are going to be wired straight through to the chip, so those at least line up. The rest we're going to have to wire all by hand, which <laughs> is going to be great. Um, and then, of course, the LS139 is going to go here. And, yeah, so, uh, and this will be our, our little pin for getting D600 into this thing. So, uh, now comes the wonderful task of hand wiring all these damn connections. So, um, I'll, uh, uh, I'm not going to make you guys sit through that. That would be evil and mean. So we'll just, uh, stop here. I will wire this thing up and see you in a few hours. Hey, this is future me coming back with one little side note here. Something to think about anyway. You don't absolutely have to use one of these address breakout things. There, there is a downside in that this breaks NUVIs from working uh, because the, it seems the NUVI player uses the D100 mirror addresses. So if, if that's important to you and all this complexity you don't want to deal with, you don't absolutely have to use any of these D1, 2, 3, 5, 6, or 7 ranges. You can forget that whole thing. And you can use IO1 and IO2. There's IO1... IO2's on here somewhere, a couple of pins down, there's IO2, and that's DE00 and DF00. Now, I don't like using those because I use those for other things, um, so when I'm making weird carts and whatever else, I'd much rather have some more, you know, obscure space that's not typically used by default for other things. Like DE and DF are used for GeoRAM and RUs, uh, FM synths, other things, right? So, if, uh, 
if you're not doing any of that kind of thing, you don't have a modem there, you're not going to run this modem in, or, or this cartridge in conjunction with modems, FN synths, RAM expanders, whatever. Um, you can skip this whole bit, and you can do it two ways. You can take IO1 or IO2 and just wire it directly to pin 23 for chip select. Um, or if you want to make better use of the address space, because it, it's a waste, right? You know, the, the, the whole addressing scheme on this computer is, is a big waste to save money, right? You know, this was a cost savings from Commodore not doing something like this. So all that to say, you can run that line directly there and burn all 256 bytes of that page, you know, DE00 to DEFF, and not really care that you're inefficient and whatever, you're just saving complexity and cost. But if you want to run multiple devices on this cart, which I plan to do, then you want to go through a decoder and break it into 64-byte pages. Uh, the JCI, well, the CIA, any of them, I think only uses 16, 16 bytes. I don't even think it uses a full 32 of them. Um, other devices might use 20 some odd, 30 some odd, but I don't know of a single device that actually needs access to 256 bytes worth of registers. So um, all that to say, this is all done for efficiency of address breakout, you know, everything here. So if you wanna make it a little less complex and have some efficiency, you can still just run an LS139 on here, and if you don't give a shit about efficiency at all, just take your IO1 or IO2 and wire it directly to the CIA and you're done. So, anyway, hopefully that made sense or something. If not, hit me up, I'll explain it better. So anyway, onward and upward. All right, here's our completed board, and from the top-down view, it looks pretty good. A couple of decoupling caps, a couple of chips, pin headers to do pin header things, and yeah, looks glorious. Flip it over, a little less than glorious, but uh, it's not terrible. I have done significantly worse work than this. Um, mostly in the computer we're gonna plug this into. <laughs> but uh, yeah, at any rate, um, the see this, this red one going up and over, that's our power feeding the chips. This other red half circle-y looking one, that is our reset line. Uh, this little solder blob here is NMI. Um, that's uh, uses NMI to drive the 6526 inside of the C64 instead of IRQ. I honestly don't know why. Um, I'm sure there's a great reason for it. I'm just not that smart. So um, at any rate, uh, this little white one is the read-write line. That's important. So we can read and write depending on what it is we really want to do with this thing. This green one, uh, that should be the clock, right? Yeah, green is phi 2. Um, that's just the system clock. We don't have the Todd clock, the time of day clock, hooked up to this chip. Um, really don't need it. Maybe we can do something one day to generate one, but really, who cares? Um, if you really want to use a TOD clock, you can use one of the 6526s inside of the machine. Uh, moving on, these black wires are data bit 0 through 7. The two white wires are the two address lines, uh, A6 and A7. That go over to the 139. And then this is the output for D6, C0, or, you know, whatever address you have is the base, right? In my case, it's going to be D6, C0. Um, and that's the yellow one going back over here to pin 23. And what else? Oh, ground. Blue is ground. So... You know, ground there and ground there, because both chips need to be grounded. And that's that. So, it, I mean, kind of tedious, but really straightforward and simple to wire this thing up. Just take your time and make sure nothing's shorted. Uh, I went through afterwards, checked all the pins adjacent to each other to make sure nothing was shorted, and I'm pretty confident we're not going to blow anything up. So, uh, I guess it's time to plug this thing in and let it rip. All right, so here we are with the awesome test machine. We have our cart installed in the back. Um, hang on, we can't see that, can we? Let's move him. All right, we have our cart installed in the back. We have our, who is he? The D600 line that comes from our little breakout board over here. Runs through this chip. He does chip selecty stuff like we looked at in the diagram. And uh, yeah, this thing ought to work. So as a little test, we have 
the power LED. Um, I wouldn't use the original C64's power LED for this because those old ones draw a bunch of power and I don't really know how much and I don't really know how much a CIA or a JCIA can drive. So this is a modern LED with a uh, current limiting resistor in line. So, you know, that's our, our little guy in there, right? So, uh, yeah, let's boot him up and I've taken the liberty off camera of writing a little test program. Let's uh, go over here. Why don't I have video output? Did I break something? All right, let me fix the video, hang on. All right, fixed our video glitches. So I've took the liberty off camera of writing a little program that will turn this thing on and off. So let's uh, load blank and list him. All right, so here it's pretty straightforward. We're we're just gonna poke two fifty five into five four nine seven eight. That's D six C three. That's the data register B, or I'm sorry A. Um, and then seventy six is the data for port A. So the uh, the data direction register just tells it if it's an input or an output. So that's why we are poking him first to tell him, hey, you guys are all outputs. That sets all eight pins on port A. So it's a PA0 through PA7 are all going to be outputs. You could just poke a 1 in there and it would just turn on pin 1. Obviously, there's the binary math that goes into controlling which pins you want to do what. You can do a bunch of 1s and zeros and whatever and convert it to decimal. But we're lazy, so we're just going to turn them all to outputs. And then... Uh, we will poke a 0 and a 1 to turn the 1 pin on and off. So it's it's pretty much as simple as that. So we should be able to see the LED is lit up. And our little guy works. So I'll probably end this here. People seem to like shorter videos more than longer videos. Um... I'll have to rig up some kind of test that will beat it up a bit, you know, shove a bunch of data in and out of it and see what happens. You know, rig up a Wi-Fi, you know, ZI modem kind of thing to it or something. I don't know. Maybe we'll use it as a parallel link to another C64 and bang stuff back and forth between the two of them. Um, you can do a lot of different things with it. The CIA is a pretty powerful little chip. And now we can actually use our user port for, say, a WIC modem and use... This port, you know, these these two new ports, actually, two new parallel ports, two new serial ports, really, on this chip. We can use those for something else. So, anyway, I'll leave you there. I hope you enjoyed this or learned something or at least inspired you to solder things together that haven't been soldered together before. So, uh, yeah, I'll come up with an idea of what else to do with this. And we'll do some more videos. And there's a whole bunch more real estate on this thing. And we have three more 64 byte address lines on this thing uh, Yeah, they're what 64 piece. Yeah, there's 64 bytes in in each break out there So yeah, we can put more chips on this thing and make them do silly things, too So anyway, take care everybody. We'll see you next time